our sixth public speaking contest. I'm, I'm so happy that we survived and we are still going strong. So let me welcome you all again for today's event. So today is, uh, is uh, one of the great afternoons because we have youth from Lower Mainland, we have youth from Abbotsford, we have from Vancouver, we have uh, Tri-Cities area, we have from Surrey, we have from Langley. So we all over Lower Mainland. It's a true inclusive contest. I won't say it is a contest, it's, a, it's an event to share the ideas. All of you have great ideas when they are doing the public speaking. Actually, a lot of times we learn a lot from their research because with the busy life we don't have a research. I didn't know about Elon Musk until the, one of the students came and talked about it. I didn't know about Trump's history or the background or his family or his origin until one of the students brought it up in the class. So there are so many ideas, so many topics they, they address at their age, it's amazing. And their analysis, their, their point of view is, is so encouraging. It's sometimes it's for us the lesson. The reason why we are Step Together Foundation and Wireless BC and all of our, my community partners are engaging in this activity is because it helps us to improve in many ways and also helps us to understand their point of view, that what are they thinking. Otherwise, as you know, as parents, when the child comes home, you ask him, how was the day? Well, oh, it was okay. That's, it. That's the end of the conversation. But through the public speaking, we have a more conversation. We have more ideas to share. They are free to share, and we listen to them. And we listen to them, and we engage accordingly, and sometimes that's why uh, our guest Richard is here, and then some of the elected officials, they, when they hear from the students, they get a new perspective that, okay, this is also the thought there. So that's the whole idea is the public speaking friendly contest is an exchange of ideas so that we learn from them, we hear them, and then we take some actions and we have an engagement together, we engage uh, positively. So today, let me introduce to you, this today's uh, afternoon will be uh, conducted by our homegrown MCs, uh, Ananya, Govindarajan, Aryan Bamzai, Rag Nair. They are through the program and this is their second year they are MCing. We have uh, one of the judges is here, Keisha, she was an MC in one of the previous ones and we have another student, she is uh, Sadhani Kumar, she has seen another one. So is there an opportunity for them to grow? Please, please be gentle on them, be kind on them. Uh, I know none of them is, none of us are perfect, but I think we have to support them uh, so that as they grow forward. So let me invite Ananya, Aryan, and Rag on the stage. So, good, welcome. Do a great job. Uh, hello everyone, uh, welcome to our another annual public speaking program. Uh, I just want to say thank you for coming out to this event because public speaking is a very uh, important life skill. Um, you know, if you're ever going to businesses or you have a job in the future, um, effective speaking is very critical in, in whatever job you might want to go into. So I'm just going to give a quick introduction of who I am. Uh, I'm Aryan and I'm in grade 10 and I go to Port Moody Secondary. This is my second year uh, emceeing with Ananya, and this is Drog's actually first time emceeing. Uh, I just want to say good luck to all the contestants. Remember, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And just have fun. Like, do not stress, just have fun. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another public speaking contest. I, as introduced, am Ananya, and I am also one of your emcees for today. So. Before I go on, I just want to say thank you to Wireless PC and the Steps Together Foundation for putting this all together. It is an honor to be a part of this event. Um, like Arian, I am also a Pre-IB 10 student, um, and I also help coach Wireless PC's public speaking classes. And because I do this, I've seen some of the kids that are going to be presenting today, and I know that everyone here, actually, it has something very special up their sleeves. So, as Simone Biles said, dear contestants, 
whatever you do, go out there on stage, put in 100% on what you're doing, and most importantly, don't forget to have fun. And this is what everyone always tells you, and I'm going to tell you again, don't forget to have fun. Okay. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, I am your last MC for today. So, like Arian has mentioned, my name is Rod, and this is my first year MCing at the Public Speaking Contest. I am super excited to be here. I have to thank Steph Together Foundation and Wireless BC for giving me this opportunity to MC here, as well as uh, to help uh, coach the public speaking classes. So I just wanted to let all the contestants know, make sure you do your 100% out there. I know it's nerve wracking, but you know, you'll get through this, right? And I can't wait to hear everybody's speech today. I hope all of you have fun today. So with that in mind, I want to introduce the judges. So first we have Coral Zarello. Would you mind standing up? <laughs> she has an associate's degree in creative writing from Douglas College and a recipient of their Maurice Hodgins Creative Writing Award of Distinction. She is in her last year of fine arts degree in creative writing at UBC. She's currently the editor of Snap Tri-Cities newspaper. She has also recently published her first chapbook titled Femme and Fable, Poems with a Gender Influence. She's also the board of Evergreen Cultural Center, and not to mention, Coral was the 2013 recipient of the Steps Together Fund. Let's give her another round of applause. For Our next judge is Keisha Mystery. <laughs> So, Keisha recently graduated from McGill University, uh, where she's pursuing a Bachelor's of Commerce with a major in Human Resources and minor in Marketing. Keisha enjoys taking part in various activities that cater to, passion, to her passion for helping others and social justice. She is one of the founders of the Wireless BC and co-president of the New Westminster Rotaract Club and co-president of the Stoll's Women in Business. Keisha likes taking on new challenges that help grow and develop her skill as well as providing others with the same opportunities. Keisha has been part of the public speaking program a long time ago and, is being, and being a past winner of this contest has been an MC as well. She's pleased to be judged at, to, she's pleased to be a judge at this event, so give it up for her again. Okay, our third judge for today is Ms. long-term care and community health clinics for both Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health. As a certified project manager, he has established standardization of project deliveries across different endeavors that he has taken. Before joining the public sector, he delivered complex projects across North America and Asia as a consultant and was instrumental in developing and leading a team of 70 plus professionals based out of Vancouver. He attributes his success to a effective and efficient communication skills, he has been delivering presentations, learning sessions, and project community to his team, cl client, and focus groups. Shred holds a master's in industrial systems engineering and complemented his engineering academic background with an MBA from Queen's University. As a professional, he strongly believes in developing the youth with skills required for the 21st century. Apart from the specific skills required in varied industries, he emphasizes the importance of communication and effective delivery. He's excited to be a part of the Wild BC Public Speaking Initiative as a judge. And finally, our last judge, Steve Kim. So, Steve came to Canada when he was just 15 years old and it took him quite an effort to reach to where he is today. He helps others on how to give presentations, and that is very authentic and clear from his business presentations to public speaking such as TED Talks. Steve strongly believes on the characteristics of a good community member, and as well as a good communicator, and soon we will learn how to be a good communicator in the future. 
Whenever Steve has a chance, he devotes his time to volu on volunteering to teach youth on public speaking since 2013. So please give it up for Steve. Okay, so next up we are having our keynote speaker, um, Mr. Richard Stewart, the mayor of Coquitlam. So I'll just say a little bit about him first. <laughs> so Richard was elected to Coquitlam City Council in 2005 and has lived all his life in Coquitlam. Richard has served his community in the provincial government as MLA for Coquitlam Mayor Bill from 2001 to 2005. Appointed MLA responsible to Francophone Affairs, member of the government caucus community on the economy and chair of the select standing community, committee in education. Richard is a writer and operates his own government relations and communications business. Formerly, formerly, he served as the chair of the Disability Issues Advisory Committee, chair of the Livable Communities Advisory Committee, chair of the Parcel Tax Review Panel, chair of the City slash School Board Liaison Community, and member of the Metro Vancouver Regional Planning Committee. Let's give it up for Mr. Richard. And thank you all. It's a real pleasure to be able to join you uh, this afternoon, particularly given the subject we're talking about this afternoon, which is communication. So I'm a writer for uh, Nose Publishing. Uh, there's, the reality is that when you write, when you publish, you can convey your opinions, you can convey thoughts, you can convince people of perspectives. But I am incredibly shy when it comes to public speaking, or I was. I've now gotten used to it. But I, and I'm thankful for the opportunities I, I got to public speak, though they weren't many. So I applaud those that tackle public speaking, particularly if they tackle it in their youth, because it will be a lifelong skill. It is about being able to convince some, being able to present ideas, Revolutionary ideas are presented by people, usually in speaking. World-changing ideas are presented by people, speaking to other people, whether it's in large groups or it's one-to-one. -one. And being able to argue your point, to make your point, to be able to um, set out a list of ideas, set out a solution to a problem, and convince others that that's the way to go. That's the, the mark of someone who can change the world, because it's hard to do it by ourselves. We have to convince others throughout life. And so uh, my life has been largely in communications. I published a trade magazine when I was, uh, when I was younger, obviously. I, do it when I, older. I did it when I was younger. And I published a trade magazine talking about uh, housing how we can improve the way we house people. And in the course of that work, I was able to make, instill some changes in the building codes and in the ways in which we develop housing in this province and in fact across the country. I did international work on, on that as well. But it was always in writing. I hardly ever spoke publicly about housing. And I regret that I didn't have that skill when I was younger. And I probably don't really have it yet, but I keep working on it. Um, so I urge you all to, to contemplate how you might change the world. And that might not be related to the housing. It might be related to uh, poverty, and homelessness, and medicine, and health. The kinds of things that we can, uh, we can tackle, the kinds of issues that our society faces. And we can do it by talking to others, sharing ideas, and sometimes, by advancing an idea or a solution that we have, and we can only advance it if it moves forward. We can only advance it if those we are communicating with come to share the idea. Because all by ourselves, we're going to have enormous challenges. So, um, it was this, uh, Ananya talked about some of my background. I was elected in, to the provincial legislature in 2001, but I think my 
I hate calling it a political career because politics sounds like something um, horrible. <laughs> I mean, politicians, yuck, right? Um, uh, and, not, and that's how people, generally speaking, um, have come to think of politics as the word politics. They think of it as, sometimes as um, a profession of people who are going to lie to you or they're going to um, advance their own agenda without contemplation of what others think. And yet the reality is that everybody I know in politics, everybody I know in public life, everybody I know in public life, um, including someone's, uh, I think someone here knows someone quite well, who's in public life, well, he works with me, actually. Everyone I know in public life is trying to do the best that he or she can for their community. I don't know anybody in public life that went in it to get rich or to steal from the people or from all the thoughts that sometimes people have about politicians of the prof, those kinds of things. And we fail sometimes to communicate how we're trying to improve the lot for our community. We fail. We fail to explain it. And when the public has a different impression, sometimes we'll blame the media. Well, in fact, almost always we'll blame the media or we'll blame a uh, special interest group or whatever. But in fact, it's, it's a failure that belongs to us. And so I will spend a lot of my time writing. In fact, right now I, I have a, an injury from writing. I have a tendonitis in my elbow from typing too much. Uh, because I spend uh, so many hours a day trying to communicate in writing, and I think um, everybody in our community, but particularly those in public life, want to advance thoughts that they believe are true and hope to convince others that they're true. So, in the future, we're going to need a new mayor. We're going to need new council members. We're going to need new members of parliament and members of the legislature. And I suspect, because I've been coming to this for a number of years, I suspect that Rodney's training some of them right now. I suspect that in this room there are people who will take on leadership roles, and it might not be an elected office, but I hope some of, some of you consider that, because ultimately we need good people to step up and run for office, and sometimes that means good people have to overcome the fear that we just spoke about, about standing here, because it is scary the first time and the tenth, the second time tenth time, and then the first time you get asked a question, and the first time you go to a public hearing, you stand up at a podium like this in front of a panel made up of myself and, and Councillor Zrill and Councillor uh, Towner and Councillor Hodge, and all of the other members of City Council. The first time you uh, sit, stand at a public uh, engagement meeting at the provincial or federal government, and you try to express your point of view about that development that's next door, the park, or whatever, the economic development plan, those are scary moments. But we need good people to do those. We need good people to stand there and make their point. And do it convincingly so that we who don't know everything will hear from you and from many other people. Because democracy only works when good people show up. The world is run by those who show up. It's a truth, it's a sad reality, but it's also something we have to embrace, that those who show up and those who speak will run the world. And I hope that many of you in this room are among those that take over when those of us with tendonitis step down and move on to other things in our lives. So on behalf of this council and the city of Coquitlam and our community, thank you very much uh, to those who worked so closely with our group. Thanks to those parents who engaged the youth and made sure that uh, support the youth in their activities, but particularly thank you to the youth who are going to tonight, this afternoon, show us the courage it takes to stand at this podium and try to convince you of something you don't believe. Because I hope we'll come to believe it. Thank you very much.
And we would like all the contestants to come up quickly for a group photo with um, Richard Stewart. Um, my, deep, my deep apologies. I'm not able to stay for the afternoon. I, my day started this morning at just before 4 a.m. because there was a mental health walk that I participated in and uh, oh, uh, worked with them for May Day Parade and, and the session at uh, for the Dominican Republic and Town Centre Park. And I'm going to another event shortly. Richard, you have a hope now because we have a gentleman, one of the parents in the art AI, the artificial intelligence, yeah. so he can make a clone of you and then sure. you can split your time at home and the other places too. <laughs> How do you know that's not what Sarge had done? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know yeah, that. Actually, make my wife happy. <laughs> And so I guess it turns out my parents were right. 
but don't tell them I said that. Anyways, dear contestants, if you are anything like me, an introvert, know that you can get up on the stage and talk, talk, talk. Yes, you are going to be presenting a five to seven minute speech, and yes, there is impromptu afterwards. But remember, today marks either the beginning or the continuation of your public speaking journey. Make the best of it. Who knows, some of you might be TED Talkers, or actors, or even the next Prime Minister. Bring your 100% to the stage today and every day from here on forward. From here on forward. As Dr. Strange said, we're in the end game now. <laughs> so with that, let's welcome our first speaker, Nandita Min. Nandita is a talented dancer, singer, and she loves to swim. Let's give her a round of applause with her speech. So I log on to Snapchat because I'm bored. Five minutes later, I log out of Snapchat because I'm bored. That cycle continues on and on and on. That used to be me. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anita Menon, and I will be talking about social media. So social media, it's quite clear that it's drastically changed throughout history. For my grandparents, social media wasn't a thing. They, it wasn't, no one even knew it existed. My parents, there were, there were very basic forms of phones in the West, but my parents did not have exposure to it growing up. In fact, my mom only laid hands on a phone when she got married and moved to Canada. My father, he was not living with his family for his whole life, where he was in boarding school. And even though he was away from his relatives, he only got his phone when he was in university. I got my phone when I was entering high school. Now, when I mean my parents' phones, I mean flip phones, the ones that you can only call people. It's not the ones we have today, where you can basically do anything on them. So when I got my phone, ironically enough, I used it for everything except calling people. So when I was growing up, I'm an only child, so I had to get really creative to find ways to spend time. So me and my friends, we would make up these little games pretending we were ninjas or spies or shopkeepers. And we had even like these little props to keep like role play going. So I got really creative with these games, and my mom's a dance teacher. So I'm constantly around little kids. I know their interests and their dislikes, and I know what they do for fun. And it's quite upsetting, because I always compare myself to them, because I see them whenever they're idle or whenever they're bored, they don't make these games that me and my friends used to. They just sit on their phones or the TV, and they just sit there for hours on end. And it makes me very upset. And we can't blame the kids for this because they learn from their elders. They learn from their siblings, they learn from their um, parents. So it could be either scrolling through Facebook when you're getting coffee, or tweeting something when you're stuck in traffic. You're using your social media in such an excess amount when you could be doing something much better with your life. So like anything in the world, there's pros and cons to everything. So social media, it can be a great thing. It's used to uh, express your feelings, your emotion, it's a great way to uh, bring, um, light, shed light to something. So looking at the pros, you must also look at the cons. So one of the main things for me that really upsets me for social media, especially for teenagers, because of this we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people. So for here, all of you guys have social media, am I right? Yeah? And you probably follow your favorite actors, your models, your friends, and all these people you look up to. And so when you're looking through your phone, you see all these pictures of people's achievements and their uh, looks, and you are always comparing yourself. You think, why can't I look like them? Why can't I be them? Why can't I have, why can't I have these opportunities like them? So now you're comparing yourself to someone's online social profile. And by doing this, you're making yourself feel very bad about yourself, and slowly but surely, you're losing, you're not being grateful for the perfectly happy, normal life you have. So for example, in school, I, was I had an assignment for English, and it was to write um, a summary for a book report. So I did this, I was very, very happy with it, uh, I worked very hard on it, I handed it in. Um, then I looked through my friends, so I was looking through social media, and there's an account that specialized, that just posts experts on books. So it was the same one that I did, and the author who did it took a totally different take on it. 
the view was different, the word to use was different, and just the style of writing was completely different. And I was very, very upset. But I thought I did it completely wrong. Um, I, I was so anxious and I was very upset and I thought I would fail. But of course, I got my report back, I got an A, and I was very happy. So what I did was I compared myself to something else and I unnecessarily got worried and I got very anxious. But in, in reality, it was totally fine. So another thing that social media can lead up to is you can easily get obsessed. I cannot stress this. Teenagers, we get obsessed to social media so easily. Whenever we're going through a hard time or a stressful situation, the first thing we do is we pick up our phone and we just scroll because that's what that's what's the easiest thing to do. Well, so for me, I used to do my homework really fast. I used to do my schoolwork, um, my studying, my tests, all very, very, very fast, just so I can sit on my phone for a few hours and do nothing. I was very productive back in the day. So um, my mother started to notice this. She's saying, you're spending way too much time on your phone, your grades are going down, so I decided to take a break. So I took one break, I didn't use Snapchat. And since I did not use Snapchat, I had all this free time on my phone, without my phone. So I started putting more effort to my homework, more effort to my extracurriculars, and my grades were up, and I was in a very, very happy position. And one week passed, I got it back, and I realized how Snap, like social media, it wasn't as important, and I didn't need it as much as I thought I did. So I had all this free time, and I used it for stuff that made me a better person, like public speaking, I started going to classes, I started reading more effort all my schoolwork, and I became a very much more happy person. So to conclude, everything in life is has pros and cons, and if we use anything ex to an excess amount, it can become very toxic. So I just urge you, whenever you're going through a stressful or a very bad situation, or just any time at all, Take a break off your phone because I guarantee you 100% of the memories you hold dear to your heart, they're memories that you made in person and not on your phone. Thank you.
that Toastmasters would be the perfect activity for me. She said that it would be good for me and it would get rid of my fear of public speaking. And it did, sort of. I say this because I still have that fear. Now, back to Toastmasters, I was excited for the first five minutes of the class. I'm serious. The only thing exciting in there was the vending machine. <laughs> now, when we got into the room where everybody was, I saw that everyone had at least three sheets of paper with them. And I was like, what? And I looked around the room to see if there were any papers, and there weren't. And I immediately knew I was unprepared. I survived my first meeting at Toastmasters. The best part was when they served snacks at the break. Mm -hmm. At the end of the meeting, they announced that there would be a speech due in one month. Oh my god. I was scared and angry, and I didn't know what to do. Now, I thought my mom was going crazy putting me in Toastmasters. But as I found out, she wasn't. Because she put me in Toastmasters, my fear of public speaking has gone to 100% to 50%. Now, after one month of preparing, my speech was finally ready. I was so confident that I would do amazing, and I would convince my mom I wouldn't need the program anymore. But I guess fate took a step back. The speech failed. Getting out of the program was also a big fail. We stayed in Toastmasters, and every time my mom said, let's go to Toastmasters, I would continuously complain about going. I wouldn't even want to get in the car. After months, my mom finally took me out of Toastmasters, and I felt like everything was finally back to normal. Until a month later, my teacher said that there was a science project due, and we would have to do a presentation on that project. Trust me, I couldn't believe it. I worked hard on my project and my presentation, and I was quite surprised that I used some things I learned from Toastmasters. On the day of the presentation, I was ready. I was nervous for sure, but I knew I could do it. The presentation went well, and my teacher was quite surprised with my delivery. And then I noticed, because of my mom putting me in Toastmasters, I learned more things, and I did well on my presentation. And that's why I enrolled myself into this public speaking competition. When I heard of this competition, I was quite excited to come. I was nervous for sure, but I was excited to come out and share my thoughts with all of you. In conclusion, I urge everyone to at least go into a public speaking competition at least once and learn how it feels like. And I thank my parents for the decision they made putting me in Toastmasters even if I disagreed with them at first. Thank you. Eventually, it did help me out. 
Uh, before I move on to the next contestant, I just want to let all our other contestants know that when you are public speaking, just try when you say your speech, just try to be a little bit closer to the edge and be a little bit more louder so the camera at the back can pick your voice up. So, in that case, next up we have Munish Peshin. Munish is a grade six student who loves to play sports. He's passionate about a topic about elder abuse. And now, give a round of applause for Munish.
Some other victims are unable to speak out due to impairments like dementia or fear they may not be believed. These elderly Canadians worked so hard throughout their life, contributed in every way possible to build a modern country which we are all so proud of. They faced hardships building this country, believed in this democratic system, paid their taxes to help build this great country. Now it's our turn to take care of them. Let us not fail them. I urge all of you to work towards the prevention of elder abuse. For more information on the prevention of elder abuse, you can visit www.cnpea.ca. Finally, ending my speech with a quote. Before you become elderly, learn how to care, love, and respect your elderly, since you will be that one thereupon in ultimately. Thank you.
instead of entering a system of love, care, and support, they're immediately placed in rundown hotel rooms where there are not enough caretakers, no access to education, and rarely enough food to fill their empty stomachs. Now, when these children are finally placed in a foster home, their conditions don't get any better. Despite a few kind-hearted parents, in 2008 alone, there were still 86,000 substantiated cases of abuse within foster homes. Even more, these children live very turbulent lives, switching between homes and schools every 6 to 12 months. Jimmy Wayne was forced to switch schools 12 times in the span of two years, meaning with every switch, he fell behind, was bullied as the new kid, and always felt alone. Finally, when these kids age out of the system, their situation worsens. Most of these young adults are left without birth certificates, which also means they're left without access to basic services such as banks, hospitals, and further education programs. In fact, between 40 to 60 percent of these youth end up homeless. They are taught the necessary skills required to survive in society with no one to depend on. Although this situation currently seems bleak, there is a simple four-step solution we can put into place to help these children. So, stability, oversight, up-to-date childcare facilities, and lessening the burden on the system. The first step in approaching this issue is to ensure that these children have stability in their lives. Foster kids are plagued with constant moving, so larger transition homes are necessary. It is said that children who have had even one fewer change in living arrangement per year are almost twice as likely to graduate from high school. By giving these children a bit more stability, we also give them a sense of dignity in their day-to-day -day lives. Directly linked with the first solution, oversight is also necessary to improve the funding for these systems. The government must keep more information about how many children are in the system and the cost it takes to care for them. Only then can we create a fully functioning system to care for our most vulnerable children. Now the most important part of the solution is the U, creating up-to-date childcare facilities. This looks like increasing the number of staff and renovating the rundown home these children are stuck into. But even more than that, children age out of the system without knowledge on how to find housing or jobs. We can support them by subsidizing housing units and creating support groups so these kids can properly integrate into society. Finally, we need to look at how we can lessen the burden on the system as a whole by looking at the root of the problem. Unplanned pregnancies and people who become financially unable to sustain their child's lives are those who most likely give their child up for adoption. By subsidizing and creating universal child care and accessible family planning programs, we can decrease the number of children entering these systems in the first place. Michael Matthews' earliest memory is from when he was three years old, being abandoned by his parents in a cold garage. Even though Michael's first father was eventually charged of sexual exploitation, Michael's life wasn't fixed. We can't give Michael back the childhood that he lost, but we can ensure that no child ever has to live like Michael again. Together, we can promise a scar-free life for the kids of our future. Together, let's ensure that every child has a little bit of soil in their lives. anything in return. 
for being kind. In my opinion, this is the one thing that should always be uh, free in life, and it's the one thing that I always work towards in my own life. Something as simple as a smile or a handshake when you greet someone is, can be enough to make someone's day a little bit better than it should be. Because it doesn't come at any cost, you shouldn't have to expect to get anything back in return as well. And in my opinion, that is why kindness is the one thing that should always be free in life. Thank you for that wonderful speech. Uh, foster care is, not, is an issue that we don't really talk about that often. We don't know the abuse that uh, children go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and you stated very important facts that I think really like, stuck with everyone in the audience. Um, so next up, we have Saya Bajaj. She is a grade 9 pre ive student who is involved in various leadership programs. Saya is very passionate about gender equality and feminism. Give it up for Saya and her speech on glass ceilings. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, respected judges. My name is Saya the Judge, and I'd like to speak to you about glass ceilings. First off, I like to say that by glass ceilings, I don't mean the glass ceilings we see in everyday structures. But by glass ceilings, I mean invisible or not yet identified limitations or boundaries. That boundaries are set for specific groups or minorities. Growing up, we all read or heard the story of Cinderella. Cinderella and her glass slipper. How the prince takes her away from all her miseries, and she becomes a princess. Well, although the glass slipper is every girl's dream, the glass ceiling is her reality. This invisible boundary, which I'm referring to as the glass ceiling, is a, bound, a, limit, a limitation that limits women's identities. It pushes them down. It limits their individual identities whether that identity is educational, political, or personal. Women have always had to live and be within their limits. Nothing for women has ever come without a fight and them having to voice and prove their point. This limitation has risen many times since the past generations. Initially, it rose when women got the right to vote. Then it rose yet once again when women got the right to equal education. Then it arose again, when women got equality in the workplace and equal opportunities. You ask, if we're equal, then where is this glass ceiling? Well, although we are equal, men are being compensated more for the same jobs than women. And that is where the glass ceiling comes into play. It's 2019, and the fact of the matter is that although women have fought long and hard for generations to be equal, we still remain the weaker gender, per se. Although women like Oprah Winfrey, Arden Huffington, and J.K. Rowling have, broke, have earned great name, fame, and success, we still have not broken the stereotype of us women being the weaker gender. By weaker gender, I do not mean mentally or physically. Because, ladies, if us women can bear children and raise them, then that right there is a superpower on its own. But by weaker gender, I refer to spreading ourselves thin between raising a family and having a successful career. This may have been a problem a few generations ago. However, in today's generation, men and women are equal. Husband and wife are equal. Men and Mother and father share, carry equal responsibilities. So then, why can a man be a father and still bring home a higher paycheck than a woman? The fact of the matter is that men bring home a higher paycheck than women. Although women have moved into high position jobs and have equality in the workplace, they are still being told or pushed into doing things which they do not agree with. 
for, luckily some of these ladies finally speak out about it. For example, we all watch the news and we all know what happened with Trudeau. Let me say no more. Women have worked hard for generations so that their, the next generations will have a better chance at having their own identities. However, this goal of having a full identity and not having any uh, barrier or limitation and having, and having a full equal life as any other men would have has not been achieved. Ladies and gentlemen, over the past four decades, women have closed the education gap. They have moved into non-traditional jobs, simultaneously managed families and challenging careers. They have demonstrated the ability to innovate, inspire, and manage effectively in every sector of the global workplace. We are only one step away from achieving full equality. And this time, I'm, going to speak to, I'm speaking to you about breaking that, that way. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a new day, a new age, and I believe this time, raise the glass to again. I believe, let's shatter it. Thank you. come across every single day. Instead, we think, what should we do today? We have a full packed schedule. So many things to do. But have I ever thought about what we shouldn't do? One thing that I will never do is disrespect. Whether the disrespectfulness is towards the environment, my parents, or my grandparents, I will never disrespect. As I know, as long as everyone else here would know, that everyone has their own journey. Everyone has their own challenges that they face in everyday life. Whether that challenge may be dealing with, dealing with certain problems in career, education, or personal life, is something that we all come across. Hence, I believe I will never disrespect anyone, whether, that, whether it is a person, environment, or my family. Thank you. identity, 
culture, religion, and language, political disloyalty to China's communist regime. As a result, the Chinese government has decided that political re-education and imprisonment is the best way to fully assimilate the Uyghurs. President Xi Jinping denies that these re-education camps exist, but it is evident through satellites that China is rapidly developing these camps so they can erase all of what's left from Uyghur culture. Almost every Uyghur knows a friend or a relative who is being detained in these camps, and yet we still hear little to no response from the international community. The people sent to these camps have been charged with no crime, but are arbitrarily detained by the government anyway. In these camps, the detainees are treated with no respect, forced to put on metal suits that weigh over 50 pounds, fed the bare minimum to survive, and barred from participating in any activity that relates to their culture. People no longer go to work, their homes are left empty, and villages left bare. Instead, they endure hours of hard labor, teaching of communist propaganda, and torture. Teeth and nails getting pulled out, snakes getting used for interrogation, tiger chairs binding people down in solitary confinement for hours on end, and even beatings to death. Around 1.1 million people are held in these camps from the ages of 20 to 79. What is happening to the Uyghurs is unprecedented in its scale, technological sophistication, and the economic resources given for the project. Moreover, the children of the detainees are sent to orphanages. These orphanages are similar to the Canadian residential schools of the 1880s. Children here are only taught in Mandarin, penalized for speaking in their native tongues, taught to hate their identity, and barred from seeing their parents and families. Thousands of parents live every day with the burden of their missing children. Now the Chinese government has invested $30 million into these so-called welfare centers to provide stability and harmony over the region. But what we really see is that the Chinese government is just using these orphanages so that they can erase their identities, one child at a time. Even outside of the camps, the Uyghurs live in a virtual cage. Guards, watchtowers, checkpoints every few feet people walk, metal detectors at every door, and surveillance cameras with facial recognition at every intersection. So what are some solutions to, these pro to this problem? Governments need to create an international coalition to gather evidence of China's serious human rights abuses and press for accountability. Big governments like the US and other major trade partners must pressure China to stop this immediately because their voices are the ones that really have an impact. But remember, all of the audience here has a voice too, so raise awareness for the Uyghurs because Uyghur activists alone can't do everything. When I first stumbled upon this issue, I found it atrocious to how a government could do such a thing to its people. But now I realize that the most important thing is to focus on how we can stop this immediately, because we must save the Uyghurs before the government is able to erase the rest of their culture. Thank you. one thing, it would be public speaking. Because I think public speaking is one of the most essential skills in your life that you can ever have. Especially for minority groups and marginalized groups, it is incredibly important to have their perspectives voiced out to the community. But, the, but if they don't know how to public speak, 
They are usually overshadowed by the majority, and their voices are not heard. Because public speaking can allow for issues like the Uyghur detention centers to be arised and taught to the public, I think it is incredibly important for everyone to learn public speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Angelina, for your incredible speech. I truly believe that you'll be amazing in politics. Next up, we have Imran Far with his speech on two life lessons he learned from his grandpa. Give it up for Imran. faith, and are willing to work hard, then you can achieve anything you want in life. Respective judges, fellow contestants, and guests. My name is Imran Grar, and I would like to share a few life lessons that I learned from my grandpa. I'm sure many of you are wondering why I chose this topic. I have always wondered about how my grandpa became so successful in life and what was his secret. Today, I would like to tell you, show some of that wisdom with all of you and hope that you will all see the value in my grandpa's learnings as I have. The first lesson my grandpa learned was to never give up on your dreams. When my grandpa first came to Canada, he had $20 in his pocket and a dream to lead a successful life. Two weeks after coming to Canada, my grandpa married my grandma, and that cost him $12. Now, it was the two of them, and he had only $8 left. Since my grandma had been in Canada for a few months, she helped to secure a job for him at the local safe and kingdom mall. Working there was hard for grandpa, because he was a new immigrant to Canada, and also a South Asian. The supervisor at the Sheikh and Chango Mall was also very mean and treated my grandpa very disrespectfully. After working at the Sheikh and Chango Mall for just a month, my grandpa decided to quit. In those days, my grandparents had only one car, so my grandma had to drop him off at work. One day, my grandma dropped him off at work like any other day and decided to go grocery shopping before returning home. But by the time she got home, my grandpa was already there. He had quit his job. When my grandma found out what happened, she reminded my grandpa about his dream and motivated him to not give up on his dream and to persevere. My grandpa went back to the same mill, determined more than ever to come out as a successful man. During this time, my grandparents had saved up enough money to lease a farm, and Grandpa worked at both places. He worked at the mill in the day and the farm in the evening, and sometimes even at night. The hard work put in by my grandparents paid off, and in five years, my grandpa was able to start his own shape and shingle mill called Silver Creek Premium Products. Today, my grandpa's mill supplies products internationally, and Silver Creek Premium Products is a well-known name in the industry. The second lesson my grandpa learned was that real success comes from lifting others up. In the span of the last 40 years, my grandpa has helped many people migrate to Canada. He has not only helped them come here, but has also helped them get jobs, food, and shelter. I remember my mom telling me a story. She was taking some courses at the University of Fraser Valley and didn't have her car. So she asked my grandpa if he could drop her off. Upon reaching the university, they saw a group of South Asian students standing by the main door. My mom approached the group 
to see if they knew where a particular building was. But it turned out that they were quite new to Canada and didn't really know their way around. Long story short, my mom helped them find their building and in turn also found hers. In the end of the day, when my mom came home, she was surprised to hear that to hear my grandma asking her about the group of South Asian kids. She was shocked and filled with pride at the same time when my grandpa handed her a bunch of his business cards and asked her to give them to those South Asian students. He went on to say, tell those students that if they ever need help with food or shelter, they could call him anytime. In my opinion, my grandpa is an exemplary person, and I would like to be like him one day. In the end, I would like to leave you with the following words. Success is no accident. It is hard work, perseverance, sacrifice, and most of all, love of what you are doing. Thank you.
But before I dwell that, I'd like to give you guys a little bit of history on Instagram. Instagram was created by Mike Krager and Kevin Systrom in 2010. Two years later, however, Instagram was bought by Facebook and they've owned it ever since. As most of you probably know, Instagram is a social media platform in which you can share photos or videos of yourself and tag other people or locations. Your posts can either be seen by pre-approved followers or just by anyone in the public. Now, this is where the negative parts of the apps start kicking in. Anyone can see your posts. Instagram also provides us with filters which we can use to make ourselves look better. This is also one of the negative aspects. Do we really have to look better just for a post? This also causes people to use many face tuning apps just so they can look good for their next post. Users have also been complaining about allegations of censorship, illegal and improper posts, and way too much explicit content. Instagram also affects teen mental health in the worst ways, and it's been proven many times over. But if that is true, then why do they target teens and young adults? The truth is, teens are quicker to get addicted to social media because they want to maintain a social status among their friends. They also want to keep up to the latest trends and Instagram is one of the best ways to do that. In 2017, a hospital in the UK conducted a survey of about 1,500 people aging from 14 to 24. Their task was to rate social media platforms based on bullying, body image, loneliness, anxiety, and depression. The survey sadly ended with Instagram being the worst for all of the above. And many other surveys done around the world has shown us the same results. Have you ever had that feeling when you're casually doing something, but you suddenly feel a vibration from your pocket? But then you take out your phone and check for notifications. You see that there's nothing there. This is your brain making you think that you have a notification when you really don't. Most people start to know that they're getting addicted to either checking their phone or just seeing if anyone simply wants to talk to them. Instagram also affects a part of our brain known as the reward circuit. When we get a lot of likes and a lot of positive comments on our posts, it makes us feel really happy and satisfied. But on the other hand, if we don't get enough likes, and if we hear a lot of negative comments, it makes our self-esteem go down very low. If all of this is true, and Instagram does affect our mental health in the worst ways possible, why do we still use it so much in just a single day? Facts are, we get addicted to these apps without even knowing it ourselves. A person might say, oh, I'll just go on it for five minutes. That can't be bad, right? But the next thing you know, almost an hour has passed by. And I am saying this from my own personal experience. When my dad bought me a phone, I made him a promise. I told him that I would only use Instagram for about one hour every day. But each day I find myself struggling to make that promise possible. A few weeks earlier, I came back home from a sports event at 4.30 in the evening. And I had not had my lunch yet. I was starving. I was out of my mind. But I thought, I'll just go on Instagram for a few minutes. It can't be bad. Next thing I knew, almost 45 minutes had passed by, and I was still starving. The moral of the story? I was addicted to Instagram, and I didn't even know it. So to try and spend less time on social media, to try and spend less time on Instagram, I don't follow any celebrity accounts, I don't follow any fan pages, and I don't go through random posts anymore. But that doesn't mean that you guys don't have to do that. That's just the way that I'm getting over my addiction. If you feel like you are addicted to any social media platform or Instagram itself, how you deal with that is up to you. So after me telling you all of these facts, and my own personal experience on this topic. <clears throat> what do you think about Instagram? Do you think we should just spend however much time we want on social media each day? Or do you think I have convinced you to spend less time on Instagram? Thank you. Should we talk about what do you wish you spend more time doing? <coughs> Five years ago, man, no 
no homework, not that much studying. I wish I spent more time having fun. I wish I spent more time playing outside with my friends. I wish I spent more time going to shopping malls, shopping with my friends, not having to worry about too many things, not having to worry about getting my homework done, doing all of these extracurricular activities. Not that it's bad for me, but I wish I had more fun. I wish that I could have done that in that time. But still, as I'm moving forward with my life, I still want to continue having fun. Thank you. Not easy, like talking about your own experience, since you're really just exposing yourself. And I really love how you exposed so many other teenagers in this room today too by asking us <laughs> that very deep personal question. Um, but next up, we have Lisa. I'm really sorry if I butcher your last name. You, Lisa. You. Uh, okay. She enjoys reading and collecting stationery in her free time. Today, her speech's topic is isolation technology causes. Let's welcome Lisa to the stage. A few days ago, I was riding my bicycle as I passed the bus station. There were several pairs of grandparents and grandchildren, all standing, waiting. But a strange thing is, none of them were talking. The children were all madly tapping on their phones, while their grandparents, glancing around, bored. They tried to start conversations only to be ignored. This seems stunning. That is a moment that is supposed to be filled with laughter and conversations is dead silent. All because of the piece of technology we have in our hands every single day. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today, the topic I want to bring to you is the isolation that technology causes. In this speech, I'll outline the current issues and propose some solutions to bring everyone back to a time when technology did not divide us. Our modern day world is made up of technology. Young people, business people, all use technology as part of their daily routines, as their lives. But behind these wonderful screens, there are hidden harms too. Ones that may not be obvious, but greatly detrimental. The most harm technology brings is against seniors, or our older generation. Older generations oftentimes have no clue about technology. Even more, their sons, daughters, Grandchildren may all be taken away by this distraction. Young people can oftentimes be carried away by the digital platforms and games that are meant to distract them. I remember when I got home, the excitement of this new piece of technology consumed my every waking moment. I spent hours, days, glancing and texting on my phone. I remember my grandma would always peer on my shoulder and ask, Lisa, what are you doing? Can you teach me? I oftentimes, as an impatient young child, would say, no, I don't have time to. You wouldn't understand anyway. Now that I think of it, the expression on my grandmother's face was sad and hurt. It was a mixture of curiosity and loneliness. But me, as her grandchild, didn't even bother to talk to her because I was so distracted by technology. Researchers show that the older people are the ones that are most likely to be isolated. isolated. The ones that don't have the instinct to go out and socialize. The Stanford Institute for Quantitative Study of Society agrees that technology isolates people. Because of the analysis that, in U.S., 
People who spend a significant amount of time online interact with their families less by an average of 70 minutes per day. Now we as young people oftentimes have friends, have games. But think about the older generation. They can't use technology. Even more, their family isn't there to talk with them because they're all absorbed by technology. With isolation, these people become more and more lonely and depressed. Think about the hurt expressions on their faces. Now, a lot of you may be confused. If this is so bad, how do we change this? Now, I'm going to present some solutions that everyone is able to integrate into their lives. But before I start, we need to recognize that technology is very important to our lives. It is a gigantic factor contributing to our civilization. So there's no way to completely ban it without reducing our life. But however, you could divide your time thoughtfully. You could spend some time talking with your family and some other time on technology. Limiting yourself to only a few hours a day on technology can actually help you keep a good family relationship. Secondly, we could start by helping seniors get adapted to technology too. We could start by teaching them the first step, teaching them how to use technology. There is no substitute that can compare to your families and friends. Sometimes in life you may be distracted by the bright light coming from technology. But however, if you feel more closely, you'll find that the brightest light come from the eyes of your families and friends. Technology already replaced your camera, your calendar, your alarm clock. Don't let them replace your family too. Thank you. so that she will be talking about it today. Give it up for Maya Passion. Best-selling author Marcy Shiroff once said that when people are deeply happy, they bring a sense of happiness wherever they go and whatever the circumstance may be. So if they're changing the oil in the car, they'll still find a way to bring a sense of joyful purpose to that too. And I could not agree with her more. 
But what I am starting to notice in the environment around me and in myself from time to time is that I am becoming less and less happier than I once used to be. And just up until last week, I started to ask myself the question, why? Why is this happening? What are we doing wrong? And that is why I am speaking here with you today. It's because I want to address the topic of happiness. So let us first start off by establishing what happiness really is. So what is it? Google defines it as the feeling of or being in a positive emotional state. And Google's not wrong. In fact, Google is most of the times right. But that's not important today. What I think is more important is what happiness means to you. So what does it? Let's just take a moment to think about it. All right. So now that we know what happiness is and we have it done, analyze it, pick it apart and put it back together. You know what it is, now understand what it means. Are we understood? Good. Now I have a question for you all. Do you attach your happiness to something else or did you come up with a definition similar to Google's? Did you or did you not? See, most of us tend to do the latter. I always hear someone say, I'll only be happy once I drink my coffee, or I'll only be happy once I return to bed once again. But through some research and some pondering, I have come to find that happiness is not a person, a place, a thing, or even a definition as Google suggests. True happiness is a state of mind. See, happiness as it turns out is an inner quality, and that means to say, if your mind is calm, you will find happiness. Even if you don't have all that you desire or all that you necessarily even need, you can still find happiness with a calm mind. True happiness comes from you and it's important to believe that it is attainable for you to even start reaching it. And they say seeing is believing, but quite honestly, feeling is the truth. Try calming your mind from time to time and I can assure you results. But why is happiness important? See, we have all this talk about what happiness is, yada, 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 but we never ask the question why it's important. And as much as we all love to feel happy, we completely ignore the question. But I'll tell you, just so you know, happiness is fundamental because it's essential to helping us achieve our goals in life, as it gives us that mindset of growth. It brings many other good things along the way. Also, by being a more positive person, we have the chance to change not only our lives, but the lives surrounding us. And, let's say positivity has a whole bunch of good technical aspects as well. Studies have shown that happiness, it makes you live longer, it improves your physical and emotional health, it helps you bounce back faster, it improves your problem solving as well as leadership abilities, and it makes you more open-minded. So now that you know what it is and sort of what it does, I've come up with a simple three-step plan to help reintroduce those feelings of positivity into our lives once again. Like I said, it's only three steps and can be done by anyone, anytime, and anywhere. So number one, adopt the right attitude. You can do this by doing random acts of kindness or smiling, even laughing more, and just being that glass half full kind of person. Adopting that mentality will definitely help. Number two is creating a better environment for yourself. And you can do this by associating yourself with more positive people or positive change groups in your community. You can reflect on yourself through journaling or maybe meditation. And the last and final, and probably the most important, is taking active steps to improve your life. See, finding your passion or finding your hobby is essential to this. And learning to forgive and let go, learning to forgive your mistakes, others' mistakes, and letting go of them. Focusing on yourself and surrounding yourself with people that care about you and people that you care about. And the reason I said that this is the most important is that we can always talk and we can always dream about how we can be better and how we can be happier. But if we never put that plan into action, it remains as it once was, just a dream, just a talk, just a plan. And it takes a special kind of person to put that into action. And of course, there is many other ways that you can make yourself more happy in the long run. But 
for the sake of simplicity and for time, I've just decided to keep it to three short core elements. And these are simplistic, these are realistic, and above all, these are achievable by anyone who wishes to try hard enough. And my hope is that at least someone in this room will be able to use them, will be able to implement in their lives these three things that I think are important for everyone in my generation. And I have hopes. I want my generation to be known not only for being great thinkers, great writers, or great something or the others, but I want my generation to be known for being the kindest, most tolerant, amazingest, and that's not a word, but you know, just throw that in there. I want them to be the most positive generation the face of this earth has ever seen. And I hope through me talking to you guys today that you'll help me realize that dream.